Richard Brunowski, President of New South Wales Chapter of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. And I'm talking to Trevor Finlay, Professor Trevor Finlay, who is uh, has a career previously in the Department of Foreign Affairs, has been a diplomat, is now a noted Australian, a distinguished Australian academic. And if I can quote from his bio, he's also, and this is most important, Chair of the United Nations Secretary General's Ad Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters for 2017. So welcome, Trevor. Thank you, Richard. And my first question to you really asks for your comment on the fact that the, the, um, the bulletin of the atomic scientists has just moved the atomic clock from three minutes to two and a half minutes to midnight. What significance do you uh, attribute to that in the context of the current nuclear uh, countries in the world and, and what's, what's been going on? Well, I think there are a few things that have gone into that decision. One is clearly the advent of the Trump administration. Mm. And the Trump administration currently doesn't have a clear nuclear policy really in any realm. We've had different statements from the president and, and other statements from key administrative We don't really know what he thinks, officials. do we? No, we don't. But then you have some real life situations like North Korea, yes. which is seeking nuclear weapons. Uh, the Iran agreement is being uh, verified adequately, but uh, the Trump administration hasn't made clear what it wants to do about Iran. So we do have uh, several nuclear situations um, happening. Uh, but the bulletin also takes into account climate change mm. now. So mm. that's rather new. It used to only take into account uh, nuclear developments. Yes. President Trump has said that he very much opposes the agreement between the six in Europe and the United States and Iran. I think personally it's an extremely beneficial and, and promising agreement we have. What's your view on it and do you think it's going to be disbanded or not? I don't think the Trump administration can actually do that. The other powers will certainly stand up to that and that will include Russia, mm. which seems uh, to be a favourite of Trump and China. All, all, the, all those countries involved have to agree to dismantle yes. it. And Iran has been complying with it. The International Atomic Energy Agency has been verifying that uh, Iran so far is complying with, with pretty much all the aspects. There were right. a few minor technical glitches, but, but by and large it's been complied with. Now you talked about North Korea. That seems to be the biggest threat to destabilization and proliferation of nuclear. For example, Japan and South Korea could go nuclear if they don't get the right guarantees from the United States for their nuclear protection. North Korea, though, uh, it's, there have been five nuclear de detonations, and yet they haven't yet developed a missile that could carry a miniaturized version of a bomb. As um, it's been said recently in the press, that they've got a bullet, but they don't have the gun to fire it. Do you think that if North Korea did develop uh, an intercontinental ballistic missile that could take a, a, a warhead, they would use it against the United States, it would, they would initiate activity against the United States, or do you think it's a kind of a, a protective device, a deterrence against regime change by the United States? Well, I think what we've always seen when states develop nuclear weapons is that they very quickly get into a deterrent situation vis-a-vis yes. -vis their enemies. It's yes. almost the natural thing to do. Yeah. And North Korea says it wants these weapons for defensive purposes. I'm not sure they use the word deterrent, but I think that's exactly what, what will happen. Mm. And so you'll have a normal deterrent situation developing. That's but as you, as you said, the, the worst case scenario will be if they do this, then Japan and South Korea will reconsider their own non-nuclear status. International Atomic Energy Agency, it seems to me that they don't have a big enough budget to do all the things they're supposed to do, which is a worldwide surveillance of nuclear facilities, not just weapons one, in fact, in fact not really weapons ones, the Indians won't let them in there, but uh, the civil programs. What, how do you think they're travelling and do you, do you think there's, it's still a competent organisation that is worth not just preserving but building up into a, a, more, co a, a, a more effective organisation? Mm. I think it's the one, one of the most competent UN type organisations. Uh, Budget is a big problem. They've been held to zero real growth for 20 years, mm. which is pretty <laughs> astonishing that they've actually kept going and doing the programs they do. But they, their mandates also increased at the same time. So they now worry about nuclear security, which is to do with preventing terrorists, acquiring nuclear weapons, uh, and also nuclear safety, particularly after Fukushima. So their mandates expanded and their financing has stayed exactly the same as 20 years ago, except for increases uh, in inflation. So there's no other organisation in the world that, that really has had to 
put up with such a um, such conditions. And they have access into all the country's signatories to the NPT and the IAEA regulations, do they? Pretty well? Yes. What yes. about North Korea? Uh, North Korea withdrew from the IAEA and of course yes. that's a problem once a country yeah. withdraws and withdraws from safeguards yeah. then there's nothing the agency can do. Although they still buy satellite photograph imagery so they still keep an eye from above as it were. But the agency relies on the cooperation of the state of course. Mm. Uh, and since the additional protocol which is a new safeguards uh, system after the Iraq debacle, uh, states are much more intensively verified than ever before. So more intensive uh, inspections, more information is required of the state, more or less cradle to grave information on their nuclear enterprise. India, Pakistan? Uh, no, well they're not party to the NPT mm -hmm. of course, neither is Israel, so they only have partial safeguards agreements. Uh, India did this deal where it would put all of its declared civilian facilities under safeguards. Mm. Uh, but of course that leaves out all the weapons facilities. Indeed. Look, thank you so much. Uh, I guess uh, you, you put your finger on it when we talked about President Trump and what he's going to do. We really don't know yet. It's going to be interesting to see how he travels, which way he goes, whether of all the conflicting things he said about nuclear weaponry and, and, and proliferation, what he's going to do. Because of course the United States is extremely important in this whole in this whole match. So thank you once again. My pleasure, Richard.